Good day and welcome to the Leading with Nice interview series podcast. My name is Matthew Yule and we want to help you inspire others, build loyalty and get results. Now today we're doing something a bit different. I'm here in Canada's capital, Ottawa, to talk to Brandon Peacock. I don't want to tell you too much about his story. And in fact, typically, you know, we often have business leaders, educators, thought leaders on this podcast. But today we have somebody who's personal story can actually lend itself to great ideas and thoughts and ideas and learning for your business. So without further ado, let's get to the podcast. Hey there and welcome to the Leading with Nice interview series podcast. My name is Matthew Yule, you know, and you know we want to help you inspire others, build loyalty and get results. If you're listening, uh, this may not sound any different. If you're watching on YouTube or elsewhere, you'll notice we're outside. I'm not in my office. We are in Ottawa, Canada, Canada's capital. And the reason we're here today is I'm with Brandon Peacock. And I'm going to let Brandon tell his story. This is the first episode of season two for us. And we wanted to launch with something a little bit different and something uh, that we think might be really valuable to you and your team. So Brandon, you know, thanks for hosting us here in Ottawa and just kind of give us um, uh, give us a, a little bit of bio information. Like, you know, how you, are you from Ottawa? How, uh, how old are you? What, do you? what do you do? Yeah, so thanks for having me on, Matthew. Um, I'm 25 years old now, just turned 25 last month. Uh, born and raised in Ottawa, just about 10 minutes from this location here uh, in Canada, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, I've been here my entire life. I, you know, hopefully we'll get out one day, but uh, it's a great city here. I'm, you know, I'm happy you came down. Cool, thank you. So we are here outside of uh, Fresh Barbershop, and it's not a coincidence that we chose to sit here. And I'm just gonna get right into it. I don't wanna set it up. I want you to tell your story. So uh, la- June 2020, you were here to get your hair cut. Yep. And uh, something happened that uh, altered the trajectory of your life. Yeah. forever tell us your story yeah so you can notice I, I still haven't got that haircut uh just over a year later now um so yeah june 2020 i showed up here 5 45 p.m after my regular work day to get a haircut um and a car pulled up right there as i was walking in and opened fire on the barber shop uh they actually were targeting the store next door um that has been you know it, it's empty now the the owner has i, I guess left uh, for obvious reasons yeah. Um, but yeah, I got caught in drive-by shooting and I got shot three times. So it's, a, it's always a little bit weird coming back here. It's my, my third time back now, mm. but um, the team here is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, it definitely was a life-changing night for me. So, and just to make it very clear for our listeners, when you say you were uh, fire, like hit with bullets by drive-by shooting, we're talking like the stuff <laughs> you might imagine in a TV or a movie show, right? Yeah. Car pulls up, somebody leans out with yep. a gun. So what was it like, yeah. You, in our conversations earlier, you've had uh, incredible recall yep. of those of those moments. Like, what was it like when you? What was going through your mind those first instances? Yeah. So obviously, I, I'm very fortunate in a weird way to to fully. I remember a good chunk of the situation. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's some areas that are a little bit gray. Um, but yeah, walking into the barber shop, uh, there happened to be the owner's wife who was holding the door open for me, literally right on those steps right there. Um, and we saw a car pull up and obviously you, it takes a couple seconds to react, but as they started opening fire, I guess I ushered her in and then ran in kind of after her. So I, I happened to take the brunt of everything, but it was obviously a, a pretty crazy night. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I got hit three times. Uh, one of them hit me in the chest, which, you know, was my biggest concern the night of, obviously. I, I think, you know, your, your heart, your lungs, you have so many vital organs there that it was obviously a really scary scene for me. And then I happened to get one in the left leg, which ended up being a non-factor. I was kind of like a ricochet bullet. And then I took one bullet in the femoral artery, which I later found out that night is probably the second worst spot you can get shot other than the jugular. So even getting shot in the head, you have arguably a better chance at survival. So that ended up being the biggest cause for concern the night of. Um, But yeah, so I I got in there, immediately kind of realized I was hit and I started basically bleeding out on the floor in there. Mm. Um, the entire barbershop at that point was evacuated, like everyone had run out the back. Um, so it happened to be me and just the woman who was holding the door for me at the time who were left in there. So she got in there pretty quick. Um, apply, I got her to apply pressure to my, my leg as I was applying pressure to my chest. Um, and then she ran over to get the phone 
and had me call my mom because she didn't think I was going to make it that night. That was night. her idea. That was her idea, yeah. Wow. Well, she said, Do you, is there anyone yeah. you want to call? And, you know, naturally I'm like, okay, I got, I got to call my mom, right? Like, um, and it's, it's funny because in her mind I was, I was toast, right? And in my mind there was, like, no doubt. I was like, ah, this is like, a, you know, minor, minor flesh wound. Mm. Like, I've, I've been through worse in sports growing up. Like, I'll be all right, you know? Like, I'll, um, it, it's actually funny as I was laying there on the floor, People always ask me, they're like, what were you thinking about, right? Like, what was going on in your brain? Um, and, you know, I, I'm sorry, Mom, if you're watching this, but <laughs> everything that was going on in my brain was, you know what, this is all right. Like, you're going to have a couple weeks off work. You're going to have some time to read some of the books you've been putting off. Like, um, you know, watch some of the podcasts you've been putting off. Like, do some of these things that you haven't had the opportunity to do because you've been so busy in your day-to-day -day life. How can you kind of make yourself better coming out of this, right? And that, that probably sounds psychotic of me. But I think it brought me a lot of peace at the same time because I wasn't thinking this could be, you know, the last breath I take, right? I was just thinking, what's next, right? Mm. Um, and eventually I caught myself. Uh, I think as soon as I got to speak to my mom on the phone, I realized it was a little bit more serious than maybe right. I'd initially thought. Um, so yeah, I, I call her. I basically just say, hey mom, this is going to sound crazy. Don't stress. But I got shot uh, going to my barber shop. I'm going to be okay. Don't worry. I just wanted you to hear it from me first. Um, now, today we're sitting here so we can laugh about things like that. <laughs> but every mother listening right yeah. now. I'm sure just, my mom wouldn't even laugh right now. <laughs> no, it's true. Like, the don't stress, but I've been shot. Now, um, you also shared, like, just with the shot to your leg, the, yep. the artery. Yep. Uh, they, the paramedics told you that 30 more seconds and you wouldn't have made it. Yeah, so I, you can't really see it in the camera here, but you can see it. That Tim Horton's right there. There Ooh. happened to be a police officer there at the time of the shooting. So he got the call and, and ran, like sprinted across <laughs> Carlin Street there. Of course there's a police officer at the Tim Hortons right across the exactly. street. Of course there is. You know yeah. what, that, that love for donuts, that, <laughs> yeah. that whole stereotype, it, it yeah. saved my life. So right? I'll, I'll exactly. never ever make fun of them again. No, for sure. Um, but yeah, he, he literally sprinted directly across the street. Um, that's actually when my phone call with my mom got cut off because they took the phone. They didn't know who I was calling, right? right? They didn't know who you were. No idea. They didn't know, right? you know all Look, they know is that you're, you've been hit with gunfire. Yeah, and it's very uncommon that someone who's not a target of a shooting get shot three times yeah. in a drive-by, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyways, because that, that uh, officer was able to get over so quickly, he basically strapped a tourniquet to my leg right away. Um, and yeah, because the femoral artery bleed is so severe, I was told that had it been 30 more seconds, I probably would have been dead. Mm. Um, so he got that tourniquet on, I believe in four minutes was the time frame. Um, I lost a, a lot of blood. I, I didn't actually really see the scene because I was in, you know, shock at the time yeah. but my dad actually came later that night and checked it out and he said it was uh, you know something like like out of like a horror movie yeah man. you you told me earlier that you were aware that yep. you were in in your own blood but oh, like not, not yeah, yeah. to the extent that was happening yeah and, and like i said i i took everything with a grain of salt right mm. i i was obviously i was very aware of the situation everything that was going on i was very um you know i was able to communicate with the first responders and everything very well uh, I'm sure had I allowed myself to drift off, it could have definitely gone south uh, right, right. quick, I think. Um, but yeah, I was very cognizant the entire time. Uh, you, you don't want to think of, it, of everything in a negative, right? I'm thinking uh, you know, in a positive sense the entire time, right? There's, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm making it through the night. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm going to be all right, regardless of how much blood's there, regardless of how stressed out everyone else around me is. Um, in my mind, there was no doubt I was going to make it through. So. But as you arrived at the hospital, yep. and uh, you shared with me earlier that you know you basically had priority A1. The floor was cleared, and you had several surgeons and doctors attending to you. Yep. Uh, they they actually presented a, a bit of a grimmer fo uh, picture for you. Yeah. So so I actually only found this out probably two months ago from my parents. So I didn't know this at the time, and I, I think they were probably scared to share it with me. But going into the hospital, um, they told my parents I had, and this was probably about an hour after I'd been in the hospital and they'd actually been able to like assess my injuries and everything. They told my parents I was looking at probably about a 50-50 shot of making it through the night. Um, and on top of that, the odds of keeping my leg were much less um, you know, relevant, mm -hmm. right? So they, they were pretty much thinking, there's a good chance we gotta cut this guy's leg off. Um, and you know, Obviously, going into surgery, I think my priority one personally was was making sure. I, I remember to the last thing I said before going under the knife was, "Do what you got to do. You knock down my odds of survival by 50% if you have to. Just like do what you got to do to keep this leg." Um, and 
it, it's an unbelievable testament, I think, to all of the, the surgeons. And I was very fortunate, too, in the sense that because I came in around 6 o'clock, I was there at shift change. So I had surgeons from the day shift and the night shift, all of, like, probably 10 surgeons who, who were all unbelievable at what they do on board for my surgery. So they were able to give me the best medical care that I, I probably could have got um, that night of. Um, so again, I think for, for a challenging circumstance and something that definitely it was, it was a terrible thing, I had every single lucky bounce that I possibly could have that night. And that's kind of where I, where I talk about um, with you, reflecting on the positives of everything. I, I'm able to do that because I had so many good bounces go my, my way, right? So if you uh, listen to the Leading With Nice interview series podcast and you're familiar with the stories we tell here, yeah. and this is not just about uh, this recovery that you've had and this uh, tragic uh, incident that you went through, while yes, there's like plenty of great learning here, yeah. uh, what I found really exciting about your story when we began talking uh, was you, uh, during the, the, between the time of being shot and your like, few days after recovery, yep. you you changed your mindset again. You pivoted yep. from just like, oh, I have some time off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make use of this yep. moment. Tell, you had another mind, sh mind shift. Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah, so, so there was maybe, maybe a couple factors that played into that. I, I think the first, as much as I had a really positive mindset going through, when you wake up that next morning, you're still so heavily sedated. You, um, you know, you're on so many painkillers because of the severity of your injury it's really easy to, and, and you know, which is fair to, to get complacent and just kind of like lay in there and just be happy you're alive and be kind of like a bit of a slug, right? Like I, I couldn't move at that mm. point. My leg was so destroyed. All, all of my ribs were broken on the left side. Um, I physically could not, not even just get up out of my bed, but like move my shoulders up, right? Um, so it was pretty easy to fall into a dark place for the first couple of days um, where I found myself just trying to sleep as much as I could. You know, mm. I was sleeping probably 18 hours a day um, and what was really unique about that is because of all the painkillers that I was on, my dreams were so wild and, and mm. vivid, and I dream pretty lucid as it is. Um, so I found myself just using that as an escape, right? An escape from reality where like in my dreams, I was still like running around do mm. with my friends. Like that's all I could think about at the time mm. was like, I hope I'm able to get out there and live my normal life again, mm. right? And like run around, play sports, do, yeah. do all these Which things. is a big part of your life. Like you play com you're pretty competitive hockey, yeah. other, you run. Yeah, I'm a very competitive person too, right? Um, so losing that would have been would have been challenging for me. Um, but yeah, so you know, I, I used that as an escape, and I think on day day three, late day two, I, I kind of realized I, it's. I was actually reading this book by this guy called Mike Majelak. It's called The Fifth Vital, and he talks about his opioid addiction when he was younger and how it really threw off his entire life, right? And, and I started to see myself. And again, it was only two days, it, it, three days. It, it probably wasn't something I would have fallen into long term or at least I'd like to hope I wouldn't have um, but it was becoming a big escape for me so on day three I started thinking to myself I'm like okay you know what what can I do to face this head-on right like obviously sitting here and being upset with myself isn't gonna do anything it's not gonna be productive how can I use this crazy thing that I've been through to you know find some purpose right mm -hmm. and how can I come back from this to the best of my abilities and that's when I decided a, I, I decided to opt out of all my pain medications, so except for my nerve medication, so Lyrica is what I was taking because the nerve damage was, was crazy. We, we shifted actually, so I lost my femoral artery. We had to take my saphenous vein from my left leg and put it in my right leg to replace the artery, which is like a very painful <laughs> nerve mm. process. I still have a lot of nerve damage. I have a compartment syndrome in my right leg now, so you know it is what it is, but I can walk and run on it, so uh, you know it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it was pretty pretty painful, so I, I stayed on that, but that didn't really alter my mental state whatsoever, right? I was still able to, to think to the same degree as I would be able to without any medication. Um, the pain meds were what was kind of, um, you know, was impacting that, right? So I got off the pain medication on day three and got back. I asked my parents to bring in a bunch of books for me. They thought I was crazy. They're like, dude, like, relax, yeah. you know, take your time. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You, you just got shot. Like, you're basically on your deathbed here, like, relax you know like feel sorry for yourself a little bit um and that narrative right there is what drove me more than anything right mm. i don't want anyone to ever feel sorry for me i don't want to i don't want to feel sorry for myself you know like i didn't see myself as a victim of circumstance i saw myself as a proud survivor of something that was difficult and i wanted to 
do something that allowed me to look back on my life and be happy with what I'd gone through, right? And you had a, you asked yourself a question uh, that I think, uh, from the outside looking in, encapsulates uh, everything, and we're gonna get to the, the, the details of that in a, in a few minutes, encapsulates. Do you remember the question you shared with me? It was around you know the mark you were going to leave or the mark you had left already. Yeah, yeah, so th that's actually a big part of, of when I was bleeding out. I, I probably should have brought that up before. Um, yeah, the biggest kind of dying thought that I had. Um, oh, you said it because you had shared me earlier that you weren't like going through, all, like your life wasn't passing in front of your eyes per no, se. No, no, not at all. Yeah. But but that was, yeah. it was my biggest thought was, and the biggest reason that I was so driven to, to get through that night was like what, what mark have I left? You know, like what, if I was to die tonight, would I be able to go peaceful knowing that, you know, my friends, I left a legacy with my friends, my family, my community, like all these things. And I, I wasn't really content with the legacy I left. I, I like to think I, I have a really good supportive family who would have, yeah. you know, obviously remembered, been very proud of me regardless. My friends, I think, would have too. Um, but I still thought there was a lot more that I could do, right? And a lot better that I could do. And that's kind of what drove me on, on day three is when I decided I wanted to start up, hit the ground running. Um, I didn't know the name at the time, but I knew that I had a unique advantage that other people wouldn't have. And I think one of the biggest drivers for that is, is my social worker is going to hate this too from the hospital. Um, yeah. Me and my social worker didn't really get along when I was in the hospital. And it wasn't because I didn't appreciate what she was doing. It was because I understood how a lot of the victim support programs work yes. um, because of my background in law. And I just didn't didn't appreciate it. You know, like I was like, you know what? Like I, I sorry, I, I did appreciate aren't, it. People that aren't as familiar, like it's yeah. it's. Uh, you were explaining to me earlier yeah. that the system is set up to achieve a certain thing. A hundred percent. And you are you wanted to achieve a different thing. Yeah. So give give people uh, viewers and listeners like an understanding of what it's set up to deliver. Yeah, I, I think. Well, I mean, there's a couple things, and it really depends which way you go. But you're you're able to kind of get a lot of like emotional support, which I think is very important. Yes, for but, sure. But in my personal understanding of what I wanted to do with my situation, I didn't want to be supported as if I was a victim of circumstance. Like I said, I, I wanted to be supported as if I was a survivor of circumstance. And I think what I found really interesting was the things that got me through my time in the hospital the most, my darkest days, um, you know, my coming to terms with everything, mm -hmm. were my, my communications with people who'd gone through like circumstances. So I was able to talk. I, I had a friend, um, his name is Michael Otu, he went through, he was hit by a car about five years ago and he slipped into a coma for like a week, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked to him every day, I was in the hospital. I, I didn't really know him that well at the time. We'd run in the same circles, we had some mutual friends. But when he saw what I went through, he reached out directly to me and he's like, look man, not many people are gonna be able to understand what you're feeling right now. They're gonna tell you, you know, allow yourself to feel sorry for yourself. Like, um, feel bad, they're gonna wish you the best, but they're not gonna be able to fully get it. I get it, I'm here to talk whenever you need. And we talked almost every day, and probably every day. Um, and he guided me through how to think in that recovery process, right? And that was what I needed. I didn't need some, um, you know, some person with a, with a degree who had a bunch of questions and boxes to check off. And I, I appreciate that, yes. you know, like yeah. I've, I've done it. I think that there is a hell of a lot of value in, in therapy. Um, you know, psychotherapy, it's something I want to do with our, with our uh, not-for-profit, right, our hopefully soon-to-be charity. Um, it's something I want to do and afford people the luxury of. For me personally, I didn't find it was the best route because I had resources like Michael in my life who I could talk to um, on a very emotional level, right? Um, so he was one of the, the driving factors for me that, that really kind of got me over the hump. And, and again, my social worker hated that because she has her boxes she needs to check off. Like obviously she, she's been taught like if he's refusing it, it's because he's not ready to face everything head on, whatever. And I was ready to face everything head on right away. Um, and she kind of, I think, thought I was maybe just in denial or whatever. Yeah, which um, would make sense, right? There's yeah. stages, oh there's God, stages to recovery. Yeah, so I was just unbelievably fortunate to have like a really good team around me. Um, you know, whether that's Frank, who we talked about, my physiotherapist as well. Um, but in the hospital, yeah, I, there was definitely some, some dark days, but I, I think I got through it all because of the amazing support I had in my family, my friend group. Sorry, my friend group, my network, everything. So you're in the hospital, you're on day three or four, you've opted out of the pain medication, minus the one to help you with your nerve recovery. Yep. 
where you know you got some books delivered maybe yeah um lots of food too the hospital hospital food's not too good so oh, i, I was really fortunate to have food. a lot of friends who, who snuck me in some food and some nurses who were great at actually bringing it up perfect so that was the nicest one to my nurses all, all the people that were in there were terrible to my nurses or oh. to the nurses but anyways so that's a rant i could get into perfect we, but we aren't <laughs> here again we aren't here just because um you had this uh horrible incident happened to you and you've somehow come out of it yep. there's actually a lot more to your story so in those days uh those short few days after uh, your recovery has begun in the hospital yep. you, you've made a decision to you've maybe started to answer the question what mark do i want to leave yeah yeah and, and i think where i realized I, I now had this maybe competitive advantage i guess you could call it that i otherwise wouldn't have had is i had a little bit of credibility that you know, was unique to my situation, right? Um, so I did a lot of research. I actually was talking to one of my friend's uh, fathers who's been a lawyer. He's uh, a guy who coached me playing hockey when I was a kid. Reached out. He had uh, he had some major issue, major health issues. Um, and he kind of reached out similar to my buddy Michael and said, um, you know, hey, I get what you're going through. Um, obviously, I didn't go through the same thing, but I understand how challenging this process is going to be here's what got me through, you should look into these different programs, right? Um, and so I looked into this thing called the Victims' Compensation Board of Ontario, um, and basically this program was put in place to help people who'd gone through traumatic circumstances at no fault of their own, um, but obviously you couldn't really pursue legal action, right? Because if, if you get shot in a gang-related shooting, you can't really sue the people who shot right. you, right? It's, yeah. It, it's a taboo, I yeah. guess you could say. It's also unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, so they had this program in place to help survivors of trauma and help loved ones of people who, who they lost to traumatic circumstances, and the Ford government took it away in 2019. Um, I'm not entirely sure their reasoning of why they took it away, but it's gone now. Um, so that's kind of something I started looking into. I started looking into, is there anything in that space to help support these people who've gone through these life-altering circumstances other than like a GoFundMe or these kind of things? Um, and again, I didn't really want to personally start a GoFundMe for myself. I had a lot of people actually who reached out who were like, we'll start it, we want to do it. And I was like, you know what, like, hold off. Like, I want to do something better and I want these people to support me when I, when I want to do that. Right? You know, there's a, I gotta say, cause I, when you told me this before, I like, I, and I don't remember the name of the movie. Yeah. Uh, Austin, our audio guy, he has an app that he told me today that he could probably look it up. But Michael yeah. J. Fox is a concierge or a porter or a doorman at a hotel. Yep. And people always offer him like 10, 20 bucks for, the, for, for helping them. He'd be like, you know, save it for when it's something big. And he has this dream of building a hotel. Okay. And finally, uh, spoiler alert, the movie's from like the 80s, so it's okay. You should have watched it by now. Yeah. Finally, at the end, somebody like funds his, his dream. Yep. And because, and part of it was because he had always turned away, like he didn't want to settle for the ten and twenty dollars. Uh, and just when you when you said that, I was like, yes. And the moral from that movie is like to pursue the big. It's worth waiting for the yep. big thing. So you're like, no, I don't want to. I don't want these. I don't want this right now. It's not what I feel is right. Yep. It was more than just like not be able to articulate the the big dream. It was yeah. like you just knew that it wasn't right for you. Well, and I, I, I didn't need it, right? And yeah. that's not to say I, I definitely don't come from a wealthy background or anything, right. um, but I had resources in my life that could help me, right? Like we talked about. You were about working full-time. At the and time, you said, yeah. And you said you were coming in here, you were full, like full business attire. Uh, so I was actually wrong about that. Oh, I thought okay. back about that. I lost, well, I, I still lost worst. I lost my, my $120 Lululemon leggings got cut <laughs> off in the process. So <laughs> that, that was brutal. That was, if Lulu's watching this, please send me some leggings. Because uh, those things are If cheap. I had known that was true, the story would be about the leggings loss. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have to hold everything else. It might be worse than having my suit <laughs> cut off. <laughs> true. Yeah, true. Um, but yeah, you know, so I took it. I didn't want to receive support from everybody for my individual self because, like I said, I knew that I was able to control my recovery process, right? And I had some great resources around me um, that I could already leverage. So where I realized there was a gap, I realized there was a massive gap in government funding for, and, and, you know, government funding and charitable organizations for victims of trauma, right? It's because the legislation had been cut so recently, there, there's no one else who really right. funds this, right? because previously there would be no purpose for a charitable organization because the government already did it. Um, so I thought about it and it didn't really come to fruition until October that I actually... Um, October went, 2020. October 2020, yeah, yeah sorry. And I, I went through the CRA and I just registered the name. That's all I did. I didn't even start really anything until... We, sorry, we filmed that initial video that we yeah. launched. Um, first take, actually funny enough, yeah. if any of you guys have seen the Hit The Ground Running, the first Instagram video was first take, fully raw, like 
that's probably the most emotional thing I've done in this entire entire process. So you made a decision <laughs> yeah. to start something that would ultimately help victims of trauma. And that yep. thing was? Was our hit the ground running um, charity. Well, not for profit right now. We're, uh, we've applied for charitable yep. status. We're hoping to you know, receive yep. it sometime in the next couple months. But yeah, so what we want to do with Hit the Ground Running is we want to raise funds for physiotherapy, psychotherapy, um, and other functional strength training related costs for victims of trauma because we, where we noticed there was a gap, and at least there was a gap in my personal recovery process, was if you get, even if you're through an insurance provider, they'll give you kind of like the bare minimum. Like their job is to get you back to whatever your job was before, right? Which for me was like a desk job. So they, were, they didn't care about the long-term ramifications, right? These guys have one goal in mind, and that's to get you to be able to sit at a desk and, and work again, right? Um, so we realized that there was a massive lack of funding for people who wanted to get back to their new 100%, right? And, and that was my goal from day one, and I had an unbelievable team around me that, that made that possible for me, but I realized a lot of other people wouldn't have those same luxuries. Um, so that's really what drove me to get Hit the Ground Running going, and obviously we're, we're in the preliminary phases right now. We've launched a virtual run in the fall, September 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2021. Yep. Um, all the dates are all messed I up know, to me. Like, like, this last year feels like it's been like six years. Well, um, <laughs> you had a thing happen in the middle I, of it too, you know. Some, so. some weird <laughs> thing, yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, September 2021, uh, the 19th to 26th, we've opened up for the entire week, uh, our virtual run. It's actually got a pretty good amount of traction so yep. far. We've got, I want to say about a hundred people signed up right now, so it's it's done pretty well in the city, and I think we're gonna have a lot more before race day too. Yep. Um, we also just launched our merch. We actually just closed off our merch sales, but uh, if you want to buy a sweater, let me know. Okay. Um, right. But but yeah, so we we found ways to get creative in the space to raise some money and also provide some cool, fun things for people, right? Um, but yeah, it, it's become a bit of a passion project for me. And when we talked about legacy that I want to leave, I, I think it would be really cool if I could take this kind of horrific situation and bring some positive about it, right? And I think it's brought me a lot of solace in the meantime. Like, you know, I'm sitting outside the place I got shot a year later. This is my, my third time back here. Yeah. Um, and that's something that crippled me at first, man. Mm -hmm. I, I came, um, the first time I came here, like I was like shaking, like it was it was brutal. I don't know if, I'm not shaking too bad today. No, it's probably just from yeah. the coffee. Yeah. Um, but it brought me a lot of solace and it allowed me to come to terms with everything that I've been through because I was able to use it for a greater purpose than myself. And that's something that I think is really cool and I'm always going to be thankful that I had the opportunity to do because of this kind of ter like terrible situation. So I just want to talk for a few minutes about like the process of like identifying the gap yep. and then trying to fill the gap. So answer me a few questions about this. When you start to identify the gap, yep. I'm, I'm thinking about business leaders who are thinking, okay, like, you know, we're actually experiencing a thing in our business and it may not be as significant as the trauma you experienced, yep. but they might be feeling a hurt or a pain. Yep. And they're I'm starting to identify a gap in the recovery. So they need to deal with the pain, right? So that you're dealing with your pain would have been um, the doctors and all the experts they brought in. But then you saw, you began to see this gap if you're in business, because you worked in business before, yep. how do you how does that translate? What are what are some things a business leader might questions have been ask themselves that you asked yourself about? Like, is this actually a gap? Like, what? How do you dis discern that? Yeah, um, I guess you have to see what the competition's like, right? And, and I think that's a weird thing to, for me to say yep. in regards to like a not for profit. But the biggest, I you know, the the key to identifying the gap for me and realizing that this was something that could be a sustainable project for me was I, I just did a lot of research to see if anyone else was doing it, right? And obviously at the time, it had a direct impact on me. I would have loved to secure some extra funding for my recovery. Yeah, for sure. Um, from credible organizations, right? Yeah. Um, I would have loved to pay Frank a little bit more than the zero dollars I paid him in my recovery process, yeah. right? Um, so I, I did a lot of research on what the competition or you know the, the environment and space was like, and there just wasn't a lot. There, there was very, very little. I, I secured, I think, a $1,000 um, check from some government organization that I basically just called and said, hey, I got shot. They're like, oh my God, that's terrible. What's your address? Like there wow. was no more questions yeah. than that. 
Yeah. Um, that was as simple as it was. They're like, the max we can do is a thousand bucks. Here's the thousand bucks. Like, wow. enjoy it however you want. And the reason you were doing this too is because your physio, all the all the support would have been like again the really what you felt the bare minimum just to get back to work. Yeah. But you wanted something more. Yeah. So let me ask you this question then. Um, you know, so often when we work with organizations at Leading with Nice, yep. one of when people are identifying these gaps that need to be filled, one of the questions we ask them is, when you look back into your history, yep. when has your organization been at its best? Mm -hmm. And so I think the question pertains to you: When has Brandon been at his best? And that might, yep. e might that doesn't answer necessarily. Oh, I was at my best when I scored a hat trick in an uh, important hockey game. Yep. So obviously you cannot replicate that hat trick moment, yep. but you can replicate the work and the experience and the talents you brought to that. Yep. So how did you identify, like when you were thinking of hit the ground running, which is about doing uh, doing runs and raising money through that, yep. one of the ways you'll raise money. Yep. How did you decide that was the thing? Like why not a uh, charity hockey game? Why not um, selling uh, biscotti uh, through uh, artists and bake shops? Yeah, yeah. There, there's two reasons for that. And I think the first is, is kind of my blanket statement with COVID was detrimental to having any sort of gatherings, right? Mm. At the time that we decided to do everything. So a virtual run, you can kind of do wherever, right? Um, but the second thing, and I think this pertains a little bit more to life in general, is I think you're at your most dangerous and your greatest potential for success when you're the most vulnerable and you're the most desperate, right? And I think that probably, you know, it might come off in a, in a weird way, but I loved what I went through because it was the greatest struggle and obstacle I ever had to overcome in my life, mm. right? Uh, when it came to, to my rehabilitation process and finding a purpose for everything that I went through, it, it, that's what kept me up late at night, mm. right? Like that's, I wanted to, I, I was working my tail off to, to get back to my new 100%. I was pushing through all these barriers I could. I was trying to, I was reading every night, trying to learn about the PTSD, the symptoms, the impacts that my situation was gonna have on me. And that drove me to want to use this to make a change for other people, right? And I think that's a really cool feeling and it's a feeling I still love in my day-to-day -day life. I find myself, I find that it's easy to get complacent, especially we live in a pretty good you know, world here in Canada, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny, we were talking about that before. Um, but when you start to get complacent, I think you start to neglect opp opportunities to capitalize on for success, right? Mm. Whereas I didn't really have the opportunity to be complacent at that time in my life. I had to be working for you know, that next, next goal every single day in my recovery process. Mm. And it drove me to want to make a difference, right? And I now had the time to, to do it as well, right? Can I offer you my perspective on that? Sure. Because you talk in this definite, like, I did not have a choice. I had to do this. <laughs> well, no, my friend, you had a choice. Yeah. Right? You could have been complacent. You could have accepted a GoFundMe. You chose not to. And I think the learning there is exactly that for a business leader. Because that's, that's who we <laughs> talk to mostly in this podcast. Um, is, like, you do have a choice. Yeah. Right, how you're going to approach. And complacency isn't a black or white. Yep. There are several layers and levels of how you approach things. Brandon, I'm gonna get pause right now because uh, there's so much to talk about. And we have more learning from you that we need to do two episodes of this. And you mentioned Frank a couple times. We haven't even talked about Frank. Yeah. I know who he is. Um, there's a few people though, if you're just listening to episode one, there's a few people that make this thing happen. Uh, Cindy Craig helps book the show. Uh, Austin Pomeroy, where he's sitting on the grass right now doing audio. Adam's our video guy behind. Uh, Adam is a, a partner of ours here in Ottawa, and he has a great uh, company with a partner that does a lot of filming. We're going to put the link to his company in the show notes. Um, Naomi Grossman helps research and do the questions. Jamie Hunter is our content manager. If you're seeing this on social uh, or reading it on the blog or, or listening to the podcast or seeing it on YouTube, you can thank him for that. Uh, I know there's somebody else. Carrie... Cotton is our account manager. Well, I'm here gallivanting in Ottawa. She's taking care of the business, making sure our clients. So thank you, Carrie, for that. And of course, my wife, Allison, which let me take a day off. She's watching the kids. Not take a day off, but come to Ottawa for the day. All of this happened. For more on this, visit our blog, the, uh, leadingwithnice.com. We also have a lot of great episodes. This is, of course, episode one of season two. There's a whole other 24-ish episodes with great learning uh, and you definitely want to come back for episode two of Brandon Peacock's story. And there's some, there is some brilliant learning 
for you and uh, your business in the next episode. Brandon, thanks for being here for part one. We'll get to part two right away. Yeah, looking forward to it. Check out www.htgrcanada.com too to learn a little bit more oh, about what we're no doing. Worries. Those uh, Hate the Ground Running's website is definitely in the show knives and <laughs> uh, we will definitely be talking more about how you can learn more about Hit the Ground Running and perhaps even, you know, if you don't, if you haven't already said to yourself, I need more of this, uh, I don't, I don't know what else we can do. Pro tip, uh, Brandon uh, should be coming to your company to do some speaking because uh, he, yeah, he's only t scratching the surface of how he brings inspiration and motivation. But that's that's aside the point because there's lots more learning. We'll talk to you in the next episode.